Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Ellis, Director of Interventional Cardiology here at the Cleveland Clinic, and we're here to discuss the ischemia trial, which was recently presented at the AHA meeting. For those of you that need a reminder about what this study was all about, it is a large-scale study of over 5,000 patients who had stable angina, generally relatively mild stable angina, and an abnormal stress test randomized to optimal medical therapy or optimal medical therapy plus revascularization generally in the form of PCI, but about a quarter of the patients who were randomized to revascularization had bypass surgery. To get uh, into the details of who these patients are, again, they had to have a positive stress test, although it's important to understand that a quarter of them just had an exercise ECG-based stress test. That was then followed in most patients by a CT scan to eliminate the possibility they had left main disease and also to assure they had at least one significant stenosis. And in fact, a fairly sizable proportion of patients with a positive stress test were thrown out of the study because they didn't have any obstructive disease. In any event, those patients went on to be randomized to optimal medical therapy or optimal medical therapy plus revascularization with a follow-up of about three years. Uh, and the principal endpoint, if you remember, is a, is a composite of death MI, unplanned revascularization, and hospitalization for, um, for cardiac disease as well as cardiac arrest. The secondary endpoint included the subcomponents of that and uh, measures of, of quality of life. It's important to understand, I think, that the, the primary endpoint was the harder endpoint, but the important endpoint of angina and quality of life was a secondary endpoint. So who are these patients? Again, a little over 5,000 patients were randomized. Three quarters of the patients were men. Two thirds of the patients were Caucasian. And if you remember, the, largely the, the remainder of the patients were from Asia because the study was recruiting slowly and they moved to China to finish off the, re, the uh, recruitment. 40% of the patients were diabetic. 20% of the patients had a prior myocardial infarction. And the severity of angina was generally pretty mild. So this was measured by the Seattle Angina Questionnaire or SAC study or SAC questionnaire. Um, most of the patients had angina on a monthly basis, a few times a month. Some patients had it weekly. A few patients hadn't had angina in months, so that's important to understand. Now, how were the patients treated? So the patients randomized to revascularization. 96% of, of them had cardiac catheterization, and 80% of them had revascularization over the course of the study, most of them early. Three quarters were done with PCI, a quarter with bypass surgery. Importantly, over the course of time, there was some crossover, so about 28% uh, of the patients randomized to just optimal medical therapy got a cath during the, the uh, course of the study, and 23% of these patients actually got revascularized. As far as the study endpoint went, the overall study was negative. That is to say there was no difference in the hard endpoints. When you look a little more carefully, however, you see what probably won't surprise many of you, and that is there's a slight excess risk early. There was a 2% absolute excess risk in the first year or so for the patients that were randomized to revascularization. But the curves crossed at about two years, and by an average four-year follow-up, the primary endpoint was seen in 15.5% of the patients randomized to optimal medical therapy and 13.3% of those randomized to optimal medical therapy plus revascularization. That difference is not statistically significant, but it's notable. And you have to ask the question, if you followed these patients for a longer period of time, what, what might have happened? So that was the primary endpoint. The secondary endpoint was that of quality of life, as I mentioned. And the bottom line is, for patients who are reasonably symptomatic, for those patients that had a SAC score of 80 or more, excuse me, 80 or less, um, they derived a benefit from revascularization. And not surprisingly, if the patients had very little symptoms, they didn't. So that the take-home messages here are principally that for a patient who qualifies, so stable angina, no left main disease, that there's no compelling need to move on to revascularization unless the symptoms are lifestyle limiting. But if the symptoms are lifestyle limiting and you choose to go to revascularization, there's not an excess price to pay. In fact, there may even be a late benefit. There's some other findings. Um, I think this study shows merit for CT angiography. This calls into question the merits of stress testing with the caveat that a fairly large proportion of these patients did not have imaging with their stress testing. And there are a lot of unanswered questions that, that will need to come out over the next few months, hopefully, to help drill down on that issue.
as well as the issue of did the patients with PCI and cabbage, did they do differently? And maybe, maybe the benefit was principally with bypass surgery and not angioplasty, vice versa. So there's some unanswered questions. But the bottom line is if a patient with stable angina should get revascularization if the symptoms are lifestyle limiting, if they don't have much in the way of symptoms, even if they have ischemia, optimal medical therapy alone is quite fine. Thank you.